Okay, now we're on. Is that better? Okay. Um, so we're sort of on this last leg of the journey here, huh, Thursday night. Um, I usually like to go first thing, first day, and kind of like, hate to say this, like get it over with. So it's been a little challenging having it on Thursday afternoon. Um, but you are with me on finding a niche in open source contributions. And I like to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Oops. Um, I am hard of hearing, and you'll hear about that more in um, later on in the presentation. Um, we don't have captions here, but I found that if you need captions while you're in here, you can go onto the online platform and you can watch the video while you're in here and turn on the captions. That's what I've been doing as my little trick. Um, I do have lots of images in my slide decks, but most of them are decorative. They're fun, they're nice, but for the sake of brevity, I won't be describing them unless they add content. Um, for folks who maybe can't see them, the slide deck should be on the session node by now. And if you download it as a PDF, I have those images uh, tagged with alt text. So if you can't see them or want to know a little bit more about them, they do have alt text attached there. Um, this is my cat, Spot. Uh, he's Spotty McSpots a lot. That's his long name, we call him Spot for short. And the reason why I mention him is because he helps me code. So if there are any typos in here, it's his fault because he's, <laughs> he's late on the keyboard or something like that. My name is Amy June, I'm never Amy, I'm always Amy June, title camel case for you programmers out there. Uh, I use the pronoun she and her. This is a QR code if anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn. But across all the social medias, uh, I go by Volkswagen Chick, and Volkswagen is spelled with an E because it's a German word. And we'll hear more about why I have that name later in the presentation as well. And I'm not going to go into a, a lot of what I do now because it is woven into the presentation and it'll be kind of redundant. But what I will say is that I am the community manager over at opensource.com, which is um, affiliated with Red Hat. It's a very unique role that I feel very privileged to have um, because it keeps me connected to the wider source, op the wider open source community. And what are some of the things I do day to day and week to week? Um, I'm on the editorial team. Like I said, as the community manager, I help recruit new authors. I nurture existing authors. And I help really spread the word of open source. Week to week, I build relationships through social media. I attend conferences. I give talks. I run lots of events in open source. Um, and then, of course, I stay connected to the community from just being at events. You'll see this sort of table of contents as, as, as I go through this today. Um, but the first thing I really want to talk about is my life before open source. So I want to look at some of the things that I did in the past that helped shape my present and most likely my future, too. I grew up in Northern California. Most of my adolescent life, I was raised by my grandparents. You know, there was apples, uh, there were cows, a marching band, um, lots of siblings. Um, I come from a broken family. I'm the youngest of many siblings. Uh, I've never once lived with all of my siblings. Um, we've never been in the same room, let alone the same town all together at once. Um, we did not all live the same kind of life. I was a ward of the state until my second year in high school about, maybe my second year in high school. Um, and then I was adopted by my grandparents. Um, but I do want to admit that I had privilege. I grew up in Northern California. I'm white growing up in Northern California. I'm a woman growing up in Northern California. All of my basic needs were met. Um, I was able to study, get good grades, go to university, um, went to the local community college. But being the youngest sibling of many came with its challenges. Um, and granted, this is a very first world challenge. But by the time I came around, my grandparents were in retirement age. So the only car left was the broken down Volkswagen at the end of the cow field that had like a tree growing out of it, right? Um, 
At every stoplight, this car would break down. At every hill with altitude change, I'd have to go out and plug in the, you know, go around the back and plug in some spark plug wires and vacuum hoses. Um, and yes, the engine's in the back because it's a Volkswagen. Um, but I had this really interesting book called The Volkswagen Guide for the Complete Idiot. And with that book alone, I was able to like drive this Volkswagen all through town. So I want to fast forward till after college. I took a job at a Volkswagen machine shop in Santa Cruz. I learned how to tear down the engine. This is here outside the machine shop. I learned how to tear down the engine um, and rebuild that Volkswagen from its original parts. Mostly with the assistance from that Volkswagen guide for the complete idiot. Um, there were shop manuals, of course, in the shop, but I found that all of those shop manuals made certain levels of assumptions of my skill set. They assumed that I actually had skills, you know? Um, adventure is really important to my youth. I spend all my holidays and vacations traveling around and visiting my family. Um, my mom lived in a new town every summer at Sim. You know, we went to New York, we went to Arizona, we went to Mexico City, Philadelphia. Um, and then during college, I took what I thought was a much needed sabbatical away from my you know, regular life and traveled all over North America, um, living out of a cab over recreational vehicle. You know, you might have seen them like the beds up above the van and that kind of thing. Um, I went with a partner. We left with no money. We traveled around and we sold jewelry out of recycled copper wire that we found. And we only sold enough to get to the next town, the next adventure, and have something to eat, maybe. Um, I could have gone to Europe, you know, but I talked about it. And my friends reminded me that my own continent and my own space has cultures that are really vast and dynamic. You know, Kansas and Texas are nothing like Northern California. Guatemala and Belize have ecosystems and cultures that Southern Oregon just don't have. So I hold a few degrees. You know, I do have that privilege of education. Um, I have degrees in other areas, but caregiving has been a really huge part of my life. Um, I'm a Quaker. So at the Quaker Church, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I work in the nursery and I mentor the youth group. I am a nurse. Yes, I'm still a nurse. Um, I have my license and I still practice all the time, especially now during COVID. It's a really important time to you know, keep up those skills. Um, but I started out as a volunteer at a nursing home, you know, serving coffee on Fridays and pushing wheelchairs at the fair. Um, when I was young, I'd visit sick and elderly people around me, you know, in my neighborhood, because I noticed their families weren't coming around a lot. I worked at state facilities as a nursing assistant. Um, I moved on and I got my nursing degree after lots of stories and follies. Um, I dabbled in restorative care therapy. I worked in the ICU. I did my stint in the maternity ward doing labor and delivery. But the first time someone died when I was with them, I knew hospice was my calling. So it's a hard, if you've never been with someone you don't know who's died, it's a hard feeling to explain and to put into words because it's more of a feeling in your body. But I felt blessed that at this moment in time, this person chose to move on with me they chose to move on with me holding their hand and move on to whatever they think was going to come next. Um, so sharing that journey with someone has really shaped how I've lived most of my adult life. I am a mother of two children. They used to be really cute. Do you see them? They're real cute in that picture. Um, they're not less cute now, but they're you know older and uh, more expensive, so that makes them less cute. Um, We've lived through poverty, we've lived through divorce, we've lived through disease, and we've lived through some very poor decisions that I've made. But 
they're all grown up. I don't have a picture of them grown up because most of the time they're doing something that's inappropriate for me to share in a setting like this. But they're making their own decisions and they're like doing a really fantastic job at being really good humans. Later in life, I went back to school and studied communications. Um, I studied intercultural communications. I studied small group communications. I've studied interpersonal communications. Um, I was fired once and I didn't like it, so I thought I would work um, in the HR department at a Bay Area college. I don't work at the HR department at the Bay Area college for a reason. So. Um, and gardening is super important to me. Um, I love to see things grow. And plants are a lot like my children. Or my children are a lot like plants. I don't know which one you want to say. But they're grown from seed, you know. And if they're given the right environment and nourishment, they can really flourish. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of times my garden doesn't look like this and it's full of weeds, but you know, at the end of the season, you rake things up and all of a sudden there's that cool little butternut squash you didn't know existed or you pull this carrot out that's like, you know, six inches wide and a foot across. So these are some of the things, you know, that have shaped my life. But what did these experiences really teach me? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. We all die, and we all make who we think are our makers. And everybody poops. I don't know how many of y'all have seen this children's book, but we are all the same, yet we're all kind of different, right? Every person has their own sense of self and beauty. You know, things can look the same on the outside. Here's a bunch of Volkswagens that all look the same, but they all have different kinds of engines on the inside, or maybe they have a radio, and maybe one of them has a radio block-off plate. Um, and then you can be very um, different on the outside. You know, all of these have different, different headlights and or different turn signals and different bumpers, and they're all different colors, and some of them have antennas, but they're all kind of the same on the inside. They transport people, and they have an engine, and they get to you to, to get you to where you want to go. And it's really important to create opportunities to help folks of different ethnic and cultural groups really find common ground, you know, respect the differences and appreciate what everyone can bring to the conversation. We all experience love and fear, and it all looks a little bit different to everyone. And we all have our own circumstances. This was not the Volkswagen that my parents gave me. You know, it did have a tree growing out of it, but it looked a little bit better than that. Um, our past is not always reflected by what people see on the outside. You know, it really, we can never really know what someone else's journey is like. You know, like I said, I felt my privilege. I go and I visit my siblings. Um, I was embarrassed by my privilege with my siblings. You know, they weren't blessed with the luck of being raised in Northern California. They weren't blessed with the luck of having all of their basic needs met. You know, there was poverty, there was abuse, there was neglect. Another important thing is that we all have our own beliefs. And that's okay. So let's talk about my journey into open source. Um, I don't have a computer science degree, and I'm not planning on getting one. I already have four degrees. I don't need another piece of paper. You know, it's just one of those things. Um, when I started open source, I didn't even have full command of a programming language. I still don't. I don't need it, right? Um, I had my obligatory WordPress blog, you know, writing about college and marriage and my kids and that kind of stuff. I took some HTML classes and CSS, um, but that wasn't enough. So 
some of you may have seen this before. My roots are in Drupal, by the way. I'm in open source, but my roots started out in Drupal. Um, this is a chart of the Drupal learning curve. Um, it's taken from the seven stages of Drupal's learning from WebFX, and I have a link there, but if you go to the slide deck, you can click on it. The top line represents Drupal, and the colored lines underneath represent all the other CMSs that aren't really as good as Drupal. Um, so the Drupal curve is steep. It goes up, and it actually kind of goes backwards a little bit before it evens out, right? But you can see there's like people hanging from it and falling off, and the, the curve kind of stabilizes. But once you think you know it, there's something that pushes you off the edge again. So why would I go from a really, really comfortable position in nursing to this? A lot of the story is really personal, and I'm not going to tell the world and share it on the internet for longevity. Um, but it was time for a change. And ironically enough, <laughs> one of the reasons I decided to get out of nursing was because the fact that everybody poops. <laughs> Getting home from the end of a shift and finding someone else's poop on your elbow, there's only so there's only so many times you can do that and like think like, am I in the right job, right? Like you don't even know where or when it happened, you know? Um, so I took my ball and went home because there was just a day that it wasn't okay anymore. So, you know, going back to that computer science stuff, it started um, with some content entry on a personal site. We have a, a, a small record label out of Santa Rosa and I was entering content, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to dictate the look and the feel of the site. I wanted to um, know what the admin user interface was. You know, I wanted to do more than just content entry. I attended um, a tech event at Stanford Web Camp. Um, and it was so much different than any nursing or caregiving event I'd, or PTA thing I'd ever been to, right? It was, I stepped on this campus, I went to a session, and I went to their after affair and I realized and I had that moment that these were my people you know have you ever got that feeling like you just go someplace and you're like wow these people aren't like me but these are my people um, so I did some research I decided to take a, a class through Drupal easy it's called Drupal career online you know um, and kind of learn some of this different stuff so I want to talk about the learning curve I had and it's a little bit different than that learning curve where you fall off a cliff so this is a version that someone drew for me. And you know, it's that traditional timeline of content entry and site building and kind of learning code, right? And then you're kind of you know, going back a little bit. Um, when I graduated from Drupal Easy, one of the things that uh, the administrators did for us was they helped us land internships. And they knew that mission-driven companies were really important to me. So they helped me find a support role at a mission-driven agency. But I'm not going to lie, like, I had a really hard time. Um, it took me about two weeks to realize that code was not for me. I wish I would have known that before, like, taking all those Drupal classes, right? But um, every time I had to build a local environment. Now, granted, this is like six years ago. So building your local environments has really changed since then. But six years ago, like, it would be tears and sweat and heartache and, like, just all of this grief just to get this local Drupal instance installed on my machine. You know, the other developers made it look really easy, um, but I struggled. And I didn't want to ask for help because, you know, I'm the only woman there. I don't want to, like, seem like, you know, this, this woman needs help, right? It was just this weird thing. Um, but I finally was vulnerable, and I asked for help. <laughs> and my mentor at the time said, I know you don't know what you're doing. I know that you don't know anything. We've just been waiting for you to ask. And it felt really good to know that they knew that I didn't know anything. I don't know what lesson I had to learn to like have to ask the question, but it really took being vulnerable because Drupal is hard. Open source is hard. Um, and I'm not saying that to be reductive. It is. It's a fact of life. It has this learning curve that we all kind of manage. Um, but Drupal and open source is more than code. And I discovered that code wasn't for me. So I learned to be confident in knowing that I didn't know everything. 
you know, it takes confidence to know that you don't know. Um, I had to learn the confidence to tell people that I was a beginner. I've never done this before, people, please help me. And that's something that really led my path to contributions. So these unique experiences bring these unique opportunities, right? Again, I had that privilege of growing up in Northern California. I'm a white woman. But can you tell from looking at me that I come from a broken home? Um, can you tell that I had to rely on scholarship to get to university? Can you tell by looking at me that I'm deaf in one ear and only have 20% in the other? You know, these are all things that aren't apparent on the outside. Um, I might have worked at a Volkswagen machine shop, but do you know that they made me say in the back so customers wouldn't know a woman was working on their car? Little things like that. Um, I'm a public speaker now, but I used to be terrified to get up on stage, you know? Um, what's another one? Can you tell by looking at me that I'm married to a trans woman? Um, so when we make assumptions, it really kind of builds these walls and creates these like false personas that we project on people. You know, and it comes back to that, you know, we can never make assumptions um, on anyone's sexuality or economic situation or political stance. Political stance was something that was really weird for me because growing up in California, I thought Republicans were a myth. So I didn't even know they existed. And so when they did and I would talk like a Californian, it was offensive to some people, but I had made that assumption. You know what I mean? Like, I know that's a really weird thing to say, but I, I learned from that. And again, going back to that Volkswagen slide, you know, it's about acknowledging the differences and appreciating the similarities. I am a very firm believer that when we include everybody, it builds a better world. And this really extends to the web and our digital assets too. Um, being a hospice nurse and just a nurse in general, um, I really understand how some folks have difficulties accessing simple things that we take for granted, like something like checking email. You know, imagine being on your deathbed and having a nurse that you don't know having to read these really personal emails to you because there's no mechanism in place for you to access the information. Um, you know, not everyone surfs the web the same way, all of those kinds of things. Um, not all of us have access to high-speed internet. Um, I found that most of the ways I give back to open source come back to making sure that everyone's included, um, regardless of knowledge level, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of abilities. And this means um, removing the barriers that come from when we build those assumptions. And we often hear lowering the barriers. Well, lowering the barriers isn't enough. You know, that isn't inclusive. It's about removing them completely. Um, and that's a really difficult thing for some people to imagine, like having a web that's open to everyone. But an example I like to give is that, you know, here, not necessarily this conference, but, you know, for a call for papers, you know, they say, you know, all religions are welcome, all abilities, all genders are welcome. But then maybe there's not a quiet space for prayer, or maybe there's not a foot washing station in the bathroom. So are you really being inclusive and inviting people that they can't practice what they believe in, in a space where they're presenting? You know, being invited and being included are really different. Falling down, I fall down all the time. Um, but if we think about all the times that we've fallen down, most of the times we've gotten back up. And there's an important thing about our failures is our failures don't hit so hard. We don't land as hard. We don't break as many bones, euphemism here, when we have support from our mentors. Um, mentors can be anyone who have helped you through an adventure that led you to where you are today. Now that you know what these experiences taught me, you know, let's move to um, how my failures lead to my triumphs. You know, it's about having compassion for myself. Um, com having that compassion has really helped me take risks because I know that it's okay to fail. Confidence is linked to doing. It's an action word. Um, and experiencing failure can help you with that resilience. Underconfidence usually means a lack of action. It's cyclical, you know, our failures and lead to triumphs 
and they really, really do. Um, I didn't touch Drupal core for a while. Drupal core is the one thing, and then there's like contributed spaces. Um, I stuck to that contributed space. You know, if you're not in the Drupal world, sometimes they're called extensions or modules or plugins, that kind of thing. I kind of stayed on the peripheral of core and helped with the contrib stuff. When I felt more comfortable about a year later, um, I tackled an issue that was marked novice, you know, a beginner issue, right? Um, I painstakingly went through the code, looking for all of the spelling mistakes. That was the issue, was there was a spelling mistake. I felt accomplished. I submitted a patch, you know, a put that was needed for review. Uh, but then a core maintainer just came in and just sort of said, well, I don't even know what they said, but it wasn't very nice. They, you know, asked me if I had grepped the issue, and I'm like, what the heck does grep mean? Like, this is novice. Like, do, am I supposed to know what grep means? But the tone they had in this issue actually kept me away from core for about a year because they kind of had this gatekeeping language about them, and it didn't feel good. Um, I think they use things like just do this and it's so easy, right? And it's like, well, is it easy? Like, I don't know. Anyway, didn't touch core, stuck with the contrib stuff, um, but Drupal 7 was being sunsetted and Drupal 8 came out and I was doing some stuff for Drupal 8 and I noticed like right there, forward facing, when you open the website, there is a typo. And I was so excited because it's like, forward facing and here I am like how did no one else notice this right so I'm so excited I build this patch and I put it in and um, <laughs> I was so excited about this typo that I didn't look at the rest of the sentence and that there was grammar issues riddled through the rest of the thing so I'm like oh crud okay I didn't know at that point I could have deleted the file and put in a new patch so I'm like patch after patch figuring this thing out and this issue was a hot mess this maintainer came in and she's like, oh, hey, what's up? You know, and I said, well, you know, this is my first real core issue and I kind of don't know what I'm doing. And the way she worked with me, knowing that I was a first time contributor basically in this core thing, because core works a little differently than the contributed project. The way she interacted with me right then and there, I knew that I wanted to be a mentor because she paved the way for me to be a contributor. Now, before you say, oh, it was just a typo, okay, because I know a couple of people might have thought that, oh, it's just a typo, it's not code, um, let's not be reductive. Um, and this is a kind of a key to like first starting in contributions when you're not a coder too, is that our typos, our grammar, our punctuation, those are all forward facing when people evaluate our software. So. When we have that sort of stuff on those forward-facing things, you know, it, it does a disservice to our open source project. You know, we want to make sure that we have the credibility. You know, if people are evaluating our projects and they see a typo, are they, are these people really, you know, they're going to think a little bit differently. Um, so it's just as important to maintain those high standards of the forward-facing stuff as it is for those coding standards as well. Another project I work with, I work a lot in the code of conduct space, um, not only in Drupal, but in the wider open source, you know, because conflicts happen. I'm the youngest sibling of many. <laughs> I had two teenage boys living in my house at once, you know. Um, I quit a job where the employer was really a jerk. Um, actually, I want to tell a story about that because <laughs> I think that's why I got into the community working group Drupal team, the community health team was, this employer was like physically threatening in my space. Um, they were reductive to me online. Um, they were really kind of damaging my reputation. And so I put in a code of conduct report, but the resolution was weird and convoluted and it doesn't make any sense. And then she was still showing up in spaces I was in with like these microaggressions. And from the outside, other people didn't know what was going on, but for people that knew the story, they were like, wow, I can't believe this person's still in your space. So again, you know, conflicts happen, um, especially when we have folks from all different areas, all different educations, all different cultures, you know. Um, I work a lot in, 
chat spaces, you know, Slack is in Drupal or G meetups when I work at Red Hat. Um, language can break down. It can be something as simple as using the phrase like, hey guys, or using that gatekeeping knowledge that I talked about in the issue queue. You know, maybe English isn't a first language and you know, some of the translations breaks down and someone um, just doesn't quite understand. So that's when I became a part of the Drupal community working group working on the community health team. Um, we're responsible for pretty important things, I think. Um, we hold workshops on code of conduct. We have these niche issue nudges, these templates, like if something happens in the issue queue, there's this resource for people to go and look at this template on gatekeeping knowledge, and then they don't have to think about what to say. They can plug in this template. You know, it really helps the communication kind of stop or move forward in a more positive way. And it really makes it a safer and like easier place for people to be. Um, live demos are really weird. Um, think about all the things that could go wrong and more, and they do usually, right? You know? Um, I love giving pragmatic talks. I usually talk something about accessibility or you know, how to write a patch, things like that. Something that people can walk away from, you know, and usually that live demo is involved. And they used to make me really nervous because I was like, oh no, like my patch is empty. What do I do? You know, sometimes I would demo a tool, um, but then the tool would be under maintenance because it was an online tool. Or I'd want to like test an accessibility tool and I had this website in mind, but they had fixed the errors and now there was nothing for me to demo, right? Um, but now I realize that we're kind of all the better when we mess up during demos because all of a sudden it has changed into this like live troubleshooting experience or it showed people that I'm human. You know, I'm this person who, you know, gets up and makes patches all the time, but hey, you just watched me write an empty one, you know? But then it also like gives them that experience of if that happens to them, now they know how to fix it. Documentation. Um, this really stems from my love of keeping air-cooled Volkswagens alive. Um, my love and passion for them being on the road really translated into the like, logical and really methodical approach that drives much of how I um, approach problem solving. And I'm a QA engineer too, I didn't mention that, but that's something that pays the bills sometimes because community management didn't always do that. So when I started in open source contributions, one of the more straightforward ways I could contribute was through documentation because there was always steps missing and me being a new person could find what steps were missing. Um, you know, being a woman at a machine shop was really hard. So, I relied on those technical manuals to extend my knowledge. But remember, I talked about how those technical documents didn't always have everything. Um, and when I, when I was doing a service and they didn't have anything, I'd really become stuck because I didn't want to ask someone else for help. Um, so working at that machine shop really made me aware of how documentation should be written for everyone. Like, Developers don't always write the best documentation because they're writing from the point of view of a developer. So if we all kind of contribute, especially as people who are new, that really helps onboard the next person. And who better to test documentation than the new people? So now these experiences, you, you see you know, kind of how I molded these experiences in my life into my path. But there's also this thing about following your passions because, yeah, you know, I got my feelings hurt and my kids fight and now I'm on the community health team. Is that fun? Might not be fun for everyone. So my failures led to my triumphs, but my passions led me there as well, you know, and I really encourage people to have your passions be part of that compass that drive you to what you want to do. Um, this is a screenshot of all the, well, some of the projects I maintain on Drupal.org. So you can see there's a lot of projects here, but what I want to point out is only a few of them are code projects. You know, you can see Drupal Core and you can see like, you know, Cloudflare Bypass or Simply Test Me or Smart Trim, but a majority of those contributed projects that I help with 
are community projects or events, because there's so many more ways to give back to open source than just the code. Drupal Coffee's up there, and that's not a code module. <laughs> that's actually, <laughs> we run a Drupal Coffee Exchange. How fun is that? We really like coffee, and so we meet a couple of times a year, and we take a bag and leave a bag. But what's interesting about it is um, there's two people in our group who have landed jobs because of the connections they met at these birds of a feathers. You know, it's the networking part, the, the networking through something that you love. You know, having a cup of coffee and meeting people is a great way to get to know the community. I'm a very passionate person and, again, love everybody, especially our beginners. I love empowering people to contribute. Drupal and WordPress run about 45% of the web. Think how absolutely cool it is that I have my code on 45% of websites on the web. And I want other people to feel that cool too, you know? Um, without able inspired volunteers, the Drupal project or open source projects, they'll just kind of wither and die, you know? Um, mentors are the key to the success of maintaining our open source projects. Um, and it comes, like Drupal has a principle, I think it's principle number three, fostering a learning environment. Don't quote me on that one because I don't know them by heart. But um, it's about getting a person to contribute, but it's also about empowering them to be a long-term contributor. You know, I worked through my ranks of that first, that first patch, you know, that first patch. But then I was like, what can I teach people? Well, I know how to write a patch. And guess what? I know how to write a patch from the perspective of a non-coder. So now I've lead first-time contributor workshops. Um, I'm a community manager for Simply Test Me. I hate getting a local environment going, and I found this project called Simply Test Me, which allows you to spin up an environment all at once. But when I first started, <laughs> The thing on the website, there's this big thing that said, you know, the forecast was cloudy with a chance of deprecation. I thought, oh no, I finally found a tool I can use. But that led me to being an advocate for the service. So now I help test the project. We've put it on a new framework, and I act as their community manager. Um, I believe the community is stronger when everyone's included, so I help with speaker and writer diversity workshops. So the diversity part is we really want to empower people from marginalized, no, excluded communities who don't always have access to everything to be empowered to write for things like opensource.com or give presentations at something like the Linux Open Source Summit. Um, I started it as a mentor in the WordPress space, but now I do it in more open source spaces. And um, what I do is I, get up here and I also have someone else with me that I'm mentoring and so the next time they can give the talk and they can mentor someone it's a really cool thing you know but that comes from my love of wanting to hear everyone's voice because you know a few years ago when we went to conferences we kind of all just saw the same person standing in front of us I'm a hospice nurse by trade so I run a meetup called Ally Talks, that's accessibility talks, um, where we have people come in and talk about diversity and inclusion and a lot about accessibility on the web. I run the San Francisco Drupal Users Group. I don't like running it. It's like the bane of my existence because that means I have to like drive and parallel park in San Francisco twice a month. But I do it because I want to keep a balance of experienced and non-experienced speakers. And then I also want to have a balance of the technical talks with the community talks. So why not have, be able to enforce my agenda by being the organizer? And today, you know, we all led the story of like, I'm the community manager for one of the most trusted sites for sharing pragmatic information on, about open source. You know, do I know everything about open source? No. Uh, am I the best author on the planet? Not even an author. But I don't have to write to empower others, you know. My passion for open source allows me to give back to the wider community. And our logo is the dandelion, you know. Think about how cool that is. You know, you can spread those seeds. You can do it organically through the wind, or you can point them in the direction you want with your breath. So I know Easy is a gatekeeping word, but the first step 
can be overwhelming and the blank um, page can be overwhelming. So I just want to leave with this, which is a common, oops, sorry, common phrase in the Drupal community. It, we say, um, come for the code and stay for the community. It's kind of cool, you know? It's about community connections. It's about connecting people through code and other ways that bring folks together. And I had a few more slides, but I talk a lot, and I went on a tangent, so I don't have enough uh, time to talk about the other slides. But one of the ways to get involved is through you know, attending camps, volunteering, organizing camps. It's a little, it's more straightforward than you think. Um, of course, you know, doing code. There's a lot of different things that you can do in the code base. You don't just have to do code. You can do social media, you can do marketing, all that kind of stuff. And when we really, it, it comes down to like, you know, all of the things that brought you here today, you have those unique experiences, you know? If you take your failures and you use them in a way that benefit others, like standing on stage and allowing yourself to be vulnerable or like being self-deprecating, you know, that kind of thing, we all work together because we have those unique visions and those unique skills and mindsets, you know, our own experiences and these lenses on the world. Um, and when we play to each other's strengths, that's really how we build a community. And then um, there's my information again, like if you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, um, because I didn't get to a couple of the slides, but I would be more than willing to help people understand how community um, engagement works through organizing events and volunteer. I have a lot to say about that, lots of ideas on how to get started. And then if you do want to write for opensource.com, there's a QR code that you can scan that takes you to opensource.com and it tells you like, you know, kind of the basic information, but really the easiest way is just ask me and I can help you do that. It's a little bit more personal than just going to a website and reading some bullet points. So thank you very much.